That is a powerful testament, New Testament reading, is it not? I love what the NASB said, the New American Standard says, a hard road ahead of them. And we're going to capture some of that in our letter today. Open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians, where we will continue in our series here. And as we have just reached the milestone of finishing one chapter, for me it's a milestone. For you it's just another Sunday, right? Amen. No, I doubt it. But uh, as we finish this, let me kind of summarize where we're at so far. In chapter 1, the Apostle Paul expresses gratitude to God for salvation and the continued faithfulness of the believers at Thessalonica. And you'll, you'll recall the circumstances they encountered there, their previous experience in Philippi, where they had just come from, of persecution and harassment by the Jews in both cities. Paul commended the Thessalonians for their steadfast hope in the risen Christ, despite those hardships and for their ongoing works of faith, labors of love, steadfastness, and hope as they ministered to and cared for one another, and as they continued to proclaim the Savior and his salvation to the citizens of Thessalonica. Through their sufferings and their faithfulness, they had become examples to all the people in the regions of Macedonia and Achaia. You remember that from our last sermon last week. And also to the new believers, everywhere the apostles went, They had heard about this wonderful thing that had happened in Thessalonica. Their genuine salvation was evident by the way in which they had abandoned the false gods of the Greco-Roman culture and the perverse lifestyles that those idols promoted and how they had repented of their sins by turning to Christ. They had placed their hope in the return of Jesus to gather in his church and to bring them into an eternal glory. Their hope emboldened their gospel witness And they embraced their sufferings as evidence of their salvation. What a novel concept, isn't it? That we embrace suffering as an evidence of our salvation. Paul had warned them that they were to suffer affliction for Jesus' sake, just as the apostles had. And you'll recall the words of Justin Martyr to the Roman emperor 100 years later. You can kill us, but you cannot hurt us. Well, that's inspiring, isn't it? The Thessalonians had placed their trust in Jesus, the one who would rescue them from the coming judgment, his wrath and indignation against the wicked who denied him and who continued to serve their false gods in their pagan worship. While the first chapter of Paul's letter rejoices in declaring the nature of gospel ministry and the fruit of redemption, which was so apparent in the Thessalonians' lives, Paul's second chapter describes his defense of his ministry in Thessalonica by addressing the accusations made against the missionaries by their enemies and their adversaries. Let's read the passage together beginning in chapter 2, verse 1, down through verse 12. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, We had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So, being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We worked night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaimed to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you, and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Let me pray. Gracious God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, by your spirit and by your word, shine the light of truth into the darkness of error. Bring the light of truth to our hearts 
and expose sin and unbelief through your revelation to us. Quicken our hearts to believe all the prophets and apostles have spoken and conform us by your word and by your spirit into the likeness of your beloved Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning in our passage, we'll see how the apostle, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, responds to the slanderous attacks made against the God's ministers and his people by examining the source of our strength, the content and the conviction of our message, and by the motives of our ministry. The first thing we should notice, however, is when you look at Paul's, uh, how he changes the personal pronouns of his letter. In chapter 1, we're all kind of hung up on pronouns, aren't we, in this generation here? But here's some very straightforward ones. It's also very encouraging to hear our, our children. Our children know the difference that there's only male and female. Amen? Good job, kids. First thing we notice, however, he uses the word you in, uh, in the first chapter. Speaking of the Thessalonians, he uses it throughout them. How you came to Christ. What kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. You became imitators of us. You received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. From the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere. Here in chapter 2, the pronouns change to we, the second person plural, speaking of himself and Silas and Timothy as they lived and worked among the believers. Now, this is significant because Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is giving us an insider's view of what genuine gospel ministry entails. He doesn't flinch from describing the hardships that they encountered, the suffering they endured, and the joy they experienced by seeing pagans born again to a new and living hope. We're going to look first at the source of our strength. In verses 1 and 2, Paul offers a contrast between the harassment they had received in Philippi and Thessalonica and their response to that harassment. Hear what the apostle has to say. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Despite the terrible sufferings they had endured at Philippi, persecuted, beaten, thrown into jail, they still had boldness in our God to declare his gospel to the Thessalonians. Now, where does boldness come from? This holy boldness had its source in our God, not in themselves or in their own strength or power. It was an external, not an internal empowerment. There was nothing in themselves that propelled them forward into more suffering and abuse. In fact, this was a common experience for Paul and Silas, and for Paul and his former associate Barnabas. You'll recall from Acts chapter 13, in the beginning when they were first commissioned as evangelists in Antioch. And after a large number of converts came to believe there, Luke writes this, the Jews stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and drove them out of the district. That's their first stop. From there they went to Iconium, where Paul was stoned and left for dead. After going back to Jerusalem for the council there in Acts 15, Paul traveled with Silas now through Macedonia, where they suffered at Philippi, where you had the tremendous high of seeing Lydia and the Philippian jailer converted, along with the tremendous low of Paul and Silas being beaten and jailed. Yet these two kept coming back for more, didn't they? They're like the Energizer bunnies. It's just a way, there was a guy, you remember Timex watches? It, it, keep, it takes a beating and keeps on ticking. Warren Sr. knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> Maybe you too, Jim and Pat. You know. They kept coming back for more. You'll recall the message which Paul brought to the Thessalonians. He reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ the Savior of the world. The truth that the Savior had to suffer even to death resonated with the believers. They understood in some sense what they were turning from. 
the false gods who had enslaved them to sin and what they were turning to, the living and true God who had forgiven their many sins and who had given them a new heart and a new spirit and the willingness to suffer for his sake as he had suffered for theirs. But Paul states in the negative in verse 1 that our coming to you was not in vain. It, it was not a failure. Is emphasized in the positive in verse 2. Look with me there. The spirit-given boldness had empowered them to declare the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict or opposition. This is the real power of gospel ministry. God empowers his ministers and his people to endure much opposition without forsaking their mission. He is the source of our strength to persevere, to suffer with joy for the sake of our future glory. Look with me at chapter 1 and verse 6 there, where Paul reminds the church, listen to what he says, You became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of of the Holy Spirit. In other words, out of opposition and hardship comes victory. God's word does not return void, but it accomplishes that which he purposes and succeeds in the thing for which he sent it, as the prophet proclaims in Isaiah chapter 55. Some of you might, who are old enough, again, I'm, I'm going to have to update my cultural references, I think, here. Some of you remember uh, the final fight scene in Rocky Three. Remember, was that the one with Clubber Lang? All right. Despite being terribly beaten by Clubber, his adversary in their first fight, Rocky had conditioned himself to take the beating and to wear down his opponent. In fact, he taunted Clubber Lang during the last round saying, Hit me again, man. Ain't so bad. Hit me again. Come on, man. You're nothing. You got nothing. He kept taunting him. And he prevailed when his opponent wore himself out throwing punches at him and left himself defenseless against the well-conditioned Rocky. You see, Rocky had trained himself to endure hardship. His strength was in his conditioning in his will to win and to prevail. At one point in the early rounds when Rocky was getting hammered by Clubber, Apollo Creed is in this corner in this fight. He gave this great line about Rocky. He's not getting beat. He's getting mad. What a great line. Now hear me, church. I am not counseling any of you to gear up for a boxing match against spiritual forces of darkness in the heavenlies. Please hear me about that, okay? You are not going to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, mano a mano hand-to-hand -hand with the devil or with his minions. Amen? The source of our strength is not within ourselves. But there, it's, the battle is not ours, but it is God's battle. But there is a sense in which we should condition ourselves for hardship, train ourselves to suffer some measure of abuse and harassment for the sake of the gospel, because it's going to come. I mentioned this last week when I call, quoted Paul's second letter to Timothy. When he writes this, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I told you then that to, to some degree, we will certainly experience some type of harassment because of what we believe. Unbelieving family members may criticize us for our faith. Co-workers or employers might be offended when we make a stand for Christ. Teachers and people in positions of authority will ask or demand that we take a position that is contrary to our faith in Christ and to somehow participate in their ungodly beliefs and behaviors. The measure of persecution may vary depending upon our context, but it will certainly come. At some point in time, you're going to pay a price for what you believe. Our goal is to be faithful whenever such encounters occur and to wait for our future indication at Christ's return. So to prepare for this eventuality, we would do ourselves great good to train ourselves in godliness by obeying the words of our Lord Jesus. If anyone would be my disciple, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
Paul instructs Timothy, again with advice, we would do well to follow ourselves. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. It is true that our trials can make us or break us, depending on whether our confidence is in ourselves or in our God. In ourselves, we're prone to fear, to flee, and to faithlessness. In our God, however, we are bold to face our enemies and his enemies. It might require standing up to a friend or a co-worker who, who belittles us for our faith in Christ, or simply to resist an invitation or demand to act contrary to our belief. We do these things not in our strength, but in God's strength which he imparts to his people in their time of need. And beloved, let me tell you, sometimes it doesn't hurt us to get mad at our sins, amen? Rather than cowering under the influence of a particular sin, a besetting sin that seems to regularly pound us over the head, we should consider taking a stand against it. Sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that the Lord is obliged to remove these sins from us to make it easier for us to overcome those temptations. Yet the example of the Lord Jesus doesn't confirm that idea, does it? In the battle for our sins, not his own, he suffered the torture and agony of crucifixion to achieve our redemption. Why do we think that it would be any different for us? God imparts strength to his children as we obey in faith. For us, conditioning doesn't mean punching a bag or lifting a kettlebell. It means time in prayer, personally and with our families. Time in God's word, personally and with our families. Time in corporate worship as a congregation. It means conditioning our minds with the scriptures to see the world rightly and to stay far from the sin which clings to us so closely. Hebrews chapter 12 is a wonderful spiritual workout routine, which we would all do well to study and follow. I, I don't mean to belabor this, beloved, but this is something that we see time and time again in our own lives. At some point in time, you're simply going to have to nail a particular sin to the cross and let it die. What that means is you'll have to endure the suffering of a sin that wants you to cave into it to indulge in a temptation to sin with your tongue, to fulfill a lust, or to give in to a craving. And when you nail that thing to a cross, you will simply have to endure the suffering of letting it die a slow, painful death. And once it's dead, you will have to keep that thing in a tomb locked up, and periodically you'll have to wrestle it back into that tomb to keep it dead you've ever done battle with a particular sin to bring it into submission to the will of God, you know what I'm talking about. Some sins are like the walking dead. You'll have to keep killing it. We're free from sin only in the next life, beloved, not in this one. But be of good cheer. Our Savior has overcome the world. Amen? Praise God. So the source of our message and the strength who declared is in our God. Verses 3 and 4 tell us what the content and conviction of our message is. It is the gospel of God. Look with me at the next two verses. For our appeal, referring back to the previous verse, the gospel of God, does not spring from error or, impu or impurity or any intent to deceive. But just as we have been approved by God and to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. Paul here offers another set of contrasts. His message does not originate in error. He is not intellectually mistaken or challenged in his understanding of the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. His message isn't tainted with impure motives or attempts to please a particular group. Nor does he engage in any form of deception or trickery. He lived what he preached, and he preached what he lived. The missionaries were consistent in their words and in their deeds. They walked the walk as they talked the talk. Paul will give examples of this a bit further in his letter. 
Rather than impurity, error, or deceit, Paul brought them the truth as it is in Jesus. Paul proclaimed the gospel of God, not his gospel, but God's gospel. He understood that he was just a herald of the great king, a simple messenger, but a messenger who was approved by God. Paul, Silas, and Timothy were men who had been tested and tried in the fires of adversity and hardship. These were not men who failed to meet the test of character that God required of all his messengers and ministers. God had examined their hearts to expose the dross of personal sin and to harden the resolve of will necessary to fulfill the duties to which they had been called. These were not your prosperity preachers or televangelists, were they? There was nothing attractive about their lifestyles or their message which would cause a listener to envy them or their position. They carried a message from the Most High God, confronting fallen men and women with their sins and pleading with them to come to Christ and to flee the wrath to come. The gospel of God is entrusted to faithful men it is a high calling to be approved by God. It requires a combination of conviction and compassion. Here in verse 4, Paul addresses the conviction necessary for faithful ministry. In verses 7 and beyond, which we'll explore next week, he'll address the compassion which is required for faithful ministers. Our Old Testament reading from Jeremiah describes the prophet's calling by God. You see, being a prophet was not Jeremiah's idea. He didn't fill out an application somewhere and said, this sounds good, I like the benefits. It was God's eternal plan, not Jeremiah's idea. Listen again to the message he was called to carry. See, I have set you this day over nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and overthrow, to build and to plant. I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar and bronze walls against the kings of Judah, its officials and priests and people. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Without this conviction that the Lord was with him, Jeremiah would have withered like a daisy in the desert. And without the conviction that they had been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, the apostles would have returned to Jerusalem with their tails between their legs, complaining that it was just too hard to preach to those wicked Gentiles and pagans. Godly conviction is the steel which supports the ministry of God's word. One of my own heroes of the faith is a man named George Whitfield. The famous open-air preacher of the 18th century who, along with John Wesley, was used by God to spark the great awakening of that century. Whitfield crisscrossed England on horseback, preaching in the fields and along the byways, wherever he could draw a crowd. Later in his ministry, he drew thousands out of the towns and, and the areas where he preached. They came to hear him preach the crucified Christ, like Paul he wasn't welcome in many of the pulpits of the churches of England in the early 1700s. They had become infected with deism, rationalism, liberalism in our modern context. And just 50 years, 50 years after the minister, after the Westminster divines had assembled to write the spiritual standards of our faith and tradition, England was on the verge of economic and spiritual collapse widespread alcoholism, spiritual bankruptcy, had destroyed Britain's social system, and they seemed headed for complete collapse. Yet in that moment, God raised up Whitfield and Wesley to bring his glorious gospel to the coal miners of Wales and the ministers of Parliament, to the elite and to the downcast, as thousands upon thousands in England and in America were awakened to the peril of their souls and cried out to God. Yet in his early years, he experienced great hardship and harassment. He once wrote this, 
I was honored today with having a few stones, dirt, rotten eggs, and pieces of dead cat thrown at me. Keep your stones in your New Testament, people. I'm just preaching what it says. Dead cat. The opposition against his ministry led to long periods of self-doubt and physical weakness. He was mocked and ridiculed by his enemies. The physical exertion of preaching so many times a week left him exhausted and sick. Still, his conviction that he was called by God for such a time as this sustained him in his ministry. He died at the age of 55 after preaching for 30 years all over England and making multiple transatlantic trips to America where he preached from New England all the way down to Georgia. Beloved, you and I are likewise called by God to serve him. Not necessarily in similar fashion, but with similar conviction. The days ahead may be long and frequently difficult. Faithfulness in your own ministries at home and at work will demand conviction that God has called you to serve him in whatever context you find yourself. The enemies of our gospel and of our God are powerful, yet they are nothing compared to the one who has called us to his service. Let godly conviction steal your own resolve to carry on in faithfulness. Amen. We've examined the source of our strength in serving the gospel, the content and conviction of that message. Let's look now at the motive of our ministry in verses 5 through 7. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. Paul returns here again briefly to the slanders made against him by his enemies. They had accused him of telling people what they wanted to hear or flattering them. Clearly, they weren't paying any attention to what Paul was actually saying, right? Remember the message he was communicating. He explained and proved that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead and said, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ, the Savior of the world. Obviously, Paul was not selling them your best life now. He told them rather that they were to suffer affliction and that they were destined for this. Now, that's hardly a recruiting poster for following Jesus, is it? I want you to envision this as a billboard or a television ad. Deny yourself, forego your pleasures, your hobbies, your personal interests and ambitions, your family and your friends. Take up your cross every single day without exception. Crucify your flesh and suffer the agony of putting your sin to death. And come, follow me. How many people run to a message like that? Brothers and sisters, you have to be called by the Holy Spirit to respond to a message like that. Not only were they not motivated by making false statements and trying to flatter their hearers, they weren't motivated by financial gain, a pretext for greed, as the apostle de describes it. Although that was a common occurrence with the traveling orators, the kind of the stand-up philosophers of the first century. As we'll see next week, Paul and the missionaries worked to support themselves, and they also received a little bit of financial support from their supporters at Philippi. Many of us know missionaries who devote their lives to the mission field working in foreign countries, remote areas, laboring in obscurity for decades, with some financial support from sponsoring churches and their own labors, many of them being self-supporting. We know of our own past pastor here, uh, John Barber, who served here for many years, serving again in North Africa, making visits over there to where he can, really a place where he has to be almost hidden churches, secret churches, because of the harassment by the uh, political leaders. The fruits of their labors will only be known in eternity. But let me assure you, beloved, fruit there will be. Fruit there will be. Paul and the missionaries did not pull any punches about their message or their motives. There was no flattery, no glory seeking for themselves. 
They didn't rely on their status, status as apostles of Christ to influence or bully the believers or to take advantage of them. Rather, listen to this as he writes in verse 7. We were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her children. Now, the Greek here is a bit complex. All your translations likely follow the um, English Standard Version, which I'm using here. What Paul is describing is the attitude and the compassion which the missionaries displayed among the new believers. Like a nurse caring for an infant in the hospital, or a mother with her newborn baby, or a grandparent holding that precious child for the very first time. Paul and Silas and Timothy exhibited patience, care, and loving devotion as they met the spiritual, the physical, and the financial needs of the new converts at Thessalonica. There was nothing harsh or rough in their interactions with them. Despite the suffering and abuse the apostles received from their enemies, they shielded the new believers physically and spiritually. One of the attributes of a minister called by God is gentleness. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul defines an elder as one who is gentle, not quarrelsome. He must not be quick-tempered, but rather hospitable. In 2 Timothy, Paul explains that the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. These are the hallmarks of God's chosen ministers, and they are non-negotiable. The must not is emphatic, just as the musts are. I like to describe it this way. Believers, and especially ministers of all people, should be thick-skinned and tender-hearted. Most people are just the opposite, aren't they? Thin-skinned and tough-hearted. They take offense easily. They're not open to criticism or correction. They're defensive and prickly. Yet the shepherds of God's flock must be tender among the sheep. Just as Paul is describing here in our text, in the Greek words, listen to the words, infant, nursing, gentle, all envision a very different motivation for leadership from what the world looks like. There are no take charge, there's no take charge leaders in the kingdom since we have one leader, Jesus Christ. This is a kingdom, listen to this believers, this is a kingdom built with sheep, not leaders. There's almost a cult of leadership in our, part, in our country with 21 steps for effective leadership, 17 keys, 26 whatever. Yet Christ commands us to follow him like little children, doesn't he? It's quite the opposite picture. And his model with the people of Israel was compassion and gentleness. In Matthew 9, the evangelist describes Jesus in this very way. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, distressed and distraught like sheep without a shepherd. With his adversaries, the religious leaders who sought to kill him, he was firm in his convictions and in his admonishment of them for their unbelief. Yet with the people, he was gentle and lowly, serving them with his life. The Son of Man, he said, bearing their sins in his death, the Son of Man, he said, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The apostle has provided his defense of his gospel ministry by sharing the source of our strength, the content and conviction of our message, and the motivation for our ministry. The mark of the Christian minister and the mature Christian believer is gentleness and firmness. Firm in our convictions, gentle in our demeanor. In our own lives and homes, may we demonstrate this same firmness of conviction and gentleness of demeanor as we bring the light of the gospel into the surrounding darkness. Let's pray. Almighty God and gracious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, you have granted us eternal life by the righteousness of Christ imputed to us by faith. You have adopted us as your sons and daughters and have given us your spirit to renew us in the whole man after the image of God
enabling us to die more and more to sin and live unto righteousness. Be our strength in suffering. Give us conviction and compassion in our hearts and homes. Grant us right motives to seek your glory rather than our own. We ask these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you'll stand as we come to our confession of faith this morning, as our worship team comes to join us. <clears throat> I believe in God, the Father oh, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, <clears throat> suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. Descended into hell. Third day he rose again from the dead. 